Louisiana. Come to the floor this evening. I've uh, been talking about this subject for nearly the three and a half years I've been a senator. And I'll tell you why I think it's important. We've grown the federal government to a level where all the people that look to it, where they're dependent upon it, try to work with it, need to know honestly where this all ends up if we do not change the trajectory. I think the easiest way to understand how we've gotten to where we are now is to look to what we used to do in the past. The country was never founded upon the principles that you borrow money to consume it. Any household, any local or state government knows you can't be successful doing that. Money should only be borrowed if you're going to invest it or get a tangible return on it, even maybe an intangible one when you look at investing in education or something like that. But there's been no system that has ever worked that ends up borrowing money from the future, from its kids and grandkids, to where that's a good business plan. You get immediately derailed in the real world. Imagine in a household, if you take in money and you spend 20% more than whatever that is, you'll go to a financial counselor. They may get you out of trouble. You keep doing it, you end up in bankruptcy court. Businesses have the rigor of competition in addition to earning revenues, balancing their own budgets, and being able to invest into the future. If you follow principles that work everywhere else, it can work here too. And we owe it to the American public. Like I said earlier, so many look to this place to be their partner in some fashion, and it ought to be one that's going to be there in the future. Let's look where we've come. From the founding of the country, we raise revenues generally on the basis of need. You would go into debt, you'd pay it off. You look at 1920, World War I, it's way over here. You borrowed money, defend the country, save others, you paid it off. Look what happened during the Great Depression, World War II. That is the deepest we've ever been in debt until we just eclipsed it recently. That's generally measured by how much debt you have as a percentage of your GDP. Great Depression, World War II. Look where we went after that. We were savers. We were investors then. We weren't consumers and spenders by nature. And we especially didn't do it through the federal government. We kept our debt in check. Even through the Great Recession, which occurred 08, 09, you were starting to see problems crop up. That happened when we put two wars on a credit card. I think the other side of the aisle said, well, if you're going to do that, there are a lot of needs in our own country, and certainly there are, from health care, education, across the spectrum, Social Security, Medicare. Look to what, what has happened since then. We have gone from being in relatively good shape pre-Gulf War, Afghanistan, borrowed that money, and then ran into the Great Recession and spent, seems like, very little compared to how significant that was, 800 to 900 billion. And from that time to the present, I think we just said, we're borrowing money, we might as well do more. And then you start doing it for things that don't make sense. I got here three and a half years ago, 18 trillion in debt. We were just approaching 
the percentage coming out of World War II here. We've now passed that and doubling down and going way beyond that. We are now here after the pandemic where we spent close to $4 trillion in 2020, a lot of it out of uncertainty. We didn't know much about it. We should have treated that with respect. We now know a lot about it. And we probably didn't need to shut the economy down, which cost us a lot, but we're through it. We certainly shouldn't have doubled down and spent another $3 trillion in 2021. I'm not going to go over. You hear it on the news. You see it. We've got inflation embedded into the economy currently. The last time this occurred, back in the late 70s and the early 80s, when inflation peaked around 10 or 11 percent, it took five years to get it back to 2 percent, where we were pre-COVID. We can expect probably something similar. We don't know. The big difference between now and then is we got a lot more debt, especially in government, so it's going to be trickier. So how do we get out of it? Well, unless we turn the tide, unless we start doing things differently, Medicare, which isn't even being addressed here, is completely depleted its trust fund in about four and a half or five years. Automatic benefit cuts when that occurs. Social Security, which has been around since the Depression paying into it, that's depleted in about 10 years. Those are two large trust funds that will have no balance in them. Then you'd have to borrow even more money to pay the benefits. Let's show a comparison of where we stack up now with other major economies. Look at that. We've known for a long time Japan, which is the third, third largest economy, has struggled to figure out how it's going to grow, how it's going to do for future generations what it's done since World War II. It has taken debt to where it's a stranglehold on its economy. Its debt is 237 percent of its GDP. Now look who's in second place. This isn't something you want to be in second place on. The United States. Our debt currently is 107 percent of our GDP. India, Germany, China, China, our main geopolitical competitor, under half of the sovereign debt as a percentage of its GDP. That's not a good place to be. They are our geopolitical competitor. And I sense they know that you need to be savers and investors if you're going to be successful in the future, if you're going to give your people what they're going to need out of a government. Financially, we're going to be up against them. And they, to me, look like they're doing a lot of things that someday pivot to where we're caught by surprise. And then you don't have the options. We start increasing to be more indebted than what we are, it'll be even harder to compete with somebody like them. We now have a 9.1 percent inflation rate. That is a pay cut for everyone. Uh, we now know, I think, what caused it. We need to just quit digging the hole deeper. Let's get out of it. Let's go back to what we know was working, at least financially, pre-COVID. We had no inflation nominal that's built into what's considered zero inflation, wages rising in the toughest places, and a growth rate that was better than what we had before, close to 3 percent. We need to start spending less through government, return the productive capacity back to the private sector, and then look at, once we get the ship right in here, what we do better policy-wise. I'm a believer. We need to fix health care. It's a broken system. It drives our structural deficits more than anything. Medicare each year, uh, like Warren Buffett says, health care in general is a tapeworm on the economy. 
What I want to do is face reality. Regardless of the tax rate, over 50 years, we average about 17.5% of our GDP in federal government revenues. If that's all you can get, regardless if you have high tax rates that gives you a lower economic growth or lower tax rates that maybe gives you a percent or more in economic growth, we need to acknowledge it. My plan does two simple things. It acknowledges what our revenue has been over 50 years, 17.5% of our GDP, tapers what we spend into it, takes what we've done here as a maneuver to escape budgeting and appropriating by putting spending on mandatory versus discretionary, which is nothing other than saying I don't want to budget. I don't want to allocate resources. We're just going to do more each year. We keep doing it. We're not going to be able to fund the programs that we all consider important. So it acknowledges a reasonable revenue level. It moves $375 billion that used to be discretionary, that is now mandatory, back to discretionary. And then it's going to be up to all of us as stewards of the federal government to see how we're going to make the right decisions to take that amount and get it down to where we cut it out of the budget. That would put us in 10 years in primary balance, meaning that the only thing that contributes to our deficit is our interest. It would clearly show, too, how the big drivers of our current deficit, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, other mandatory spending features are driving it. And yes, if we want to get to a real balanced budget that covers your interest, you'd have to actually find ways to do the same things with less money. Defense is always a topic on my side of the aisle. This spends on defense, arguably the most important thing we need to do as a federal government. I think there's a lot of bipartisan interest in defending our country and financing it accordingly. This spends on defense above the CBO line and gets its numbers from the Senate Armed Services Committee, plugs it in. It is going to be more robust there than what the CBO has by a little bit, because I'm a believer that what's driven this issue over the long run is what I call the unholy alliance. Folks on my side, whatever it takes, we'll spend it on defense. Said it's the most important thing we do, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, those are important too. They're going broke over time. So we need to work on all of that to rein it in. But defense, the most important thing, is going to be at a level that keeps us secure. If we don't exercise fiscal restraint, if we don't make the tough decisions that everyone does in running their own budgets, whether it's in a business, a local state government, or even a household, it's going to be a hard landing someday that none of us will like. A lot of what is about running anything successfully is having a good plan. I don't think our plan makes sense for the future. But the other component, and I'll never forget the first budget meeting I was in here, one of the senators said, Mike, the reason this keeps coming back and back is we do not have political will. And whether it's political will that you need to make things work here, whether it's determination, whatever you want to call it, it's the marketplace when you run a business, it's a balanced budget amendment and statute when you've got a state government, there's got to be more discipline. Let's put that last chart up here and I, I want to reemphasize because I got some on my side that think we aren't being robust enough on defense. And uh, we just looked at that chart where it is the most robust, but I want to go back to this one again. 
This one says it all. Look at where we've come, where the greatest generation left us. Remember, paid off the debt from World War II, built the interstate highway system to where we are now in literally 40 years. That is shameful. All I'm saying is my budget makes it to where we've got 10 years, don't even have to cover the interest, but we need to bring it back into what's called primary balance. And when I would hope I have some friends on the other side of the aisle that see that this makes sense, because we'll need it for their priorities. All I can tell you, if we have to remediate this by running the system into the ditch, it'll be a lot harder proposition to get it back where it was when the greatest generation left us in good shape. Madam President, I yield the floor. Ms. Baldwin.